uh, looking at the heart and body in the clinic. And we're very, very excited to have the people that we have here in front of you. Uh, so the person standing up is Jessica Bellamy, and she's standing up because she's an exercise physiologist. <laughs> she, I think she should run on the spot. <laughs> Now, uh, Jessica is an accredited exercise physiologist at the multidisciplinary specialist health team with the Children's Hospital at Westmead. She leads lifestyle modification programs with a specific emphasis on exercise interventions to improve cardiometabolic health of children and adolescents with intellectual disability. It's wonderful to have Jessica and very helpful that she's um, agreed to be part of the healthy lifestyle intervention that we're developing because she has first hand experience about how to work. Now, we have next to uh, Jessica, Professor David Dossiter. David is Director of the Mental Health, uh, uh, Director of Mental Health at the Sydney Children's Hospital Network and a Clinical Associate Professor at Sydney Medical School, Sydney University Medical School. He's a child psychiatrist with a special interest in intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder and a team leader of the developmental psychiatry team at the Children's Hospital at Westmead. Thank you, David, for being part of the panel. Right. Sorry. Oh, Rani. Sorry, we have a Rani next, and the Rani uh, needs no introduction. And uh, at the end of the uh, table here, we have Dr. Aileen Smith. Aileen is a general practitioner at the Village Medical Practice in Sydney and a senior lecturer in the School of Medicine at the University of Notre Dame, Australia. And Aileen is just a wonderful inspiration in primary care as she thinks how. Uh, she can uh, equip other uh, general practitioners to do a better job for people with intellectual disability. So welcome, Aileen. Uh, okay, I'm going to start by asking um, each of the panel members not to introduce themselves because we're going to spend too much time finding out more about people. Okay, I don't think we need to do that. I think they have had some introductions. Uh, I would like to ask the first question for the panel. How does a multidisciplinary approach assist you in achieving cardiometabolic risk reduction when working with people with an intellectual disability? I'll repeat that for this long. How does a multidisciplinary approach assist you in achieving cardiometabolic risk reduction when working with people with an intellectual disability? If you could uh, give three clear short points and then we'll get to the questions. And please just um, whatever order you're comfortable with. Sure. Um, I think the first one, and I'm going to promote EPs here as well, is the fact that there is a great opportunity for exercise physiologists to work in the role and make a very big difference, and I've seen that firsthand. Um, we have the ability, as Simon said, to work with, we're, we're trained, we're qualified, we're ready to go, and we're, we're looking for jobs in order to, to be there and help the people that we can. I think secondly, is about providing enough support for the individual and for the carer to actually take on board the advice that we as clinicians are giving and implementing those programs. So whether it's about taking their medication regularly, whether it's about providing an exercise program and actually following through with it, whether it's about making healthier dietary choices, you need to be able to have a support system in place. And for, for me, what I've found personally is that most of the time, dealing with children and particularly children with a lot of behavioural issues is that we need lots of other support in place first. So whether it's we need to get some respite on board or that we need some behaviour support or some speech involved so that we can create a program that the child or the adolescent is going to be able to follow and to understand. I think that's one of the most important things is providing that support. And that's where a lot of my job goes to. It's not always about implementing a program straight away. It's about creating that support first and then implementing. And I think the third thing would be about um, being able to provide holistic approach to risk reduction. So if we have a psychiatrist on board, we are able to deal with medication. I have a dietitian on my team as well, so we have that. We have an exercise physiologist. We also have a nurse and a paediatrician. So if we need to get things like blood tests done, cardiac echoes done, sleep studies done, we've designed a pathway with the children's hospital so that we have a specific pathway for our kids with intellectual disability. There's a social story that's read. The staff are aware what is going to happen and the extra support that's required for that family. If we are able to get all of the risk factors 
manage, it makes it a lot easier um, to do our job. Additionally, I actually tend to see my patients more than what the paediatrician or our psychiatrist does, so I can do those follow-up measures quite frequently and then let the, the doctors know how things are going. I think that's a, very important as well. Thanks. I just asked a practical question about your program. Is it yes. tertiary? Yes. So paediatrician has to refer in who has like referral rights at the hospital? doesn't have to have referral rights at the hospital. Um, so we're an outreach service. So whilst we're with the children's hospital, we're actually out in Fairfield. Um, so any paediatrician is able to refer into our service. Or we also have a self-referral system as well. Is there a separate algorithm for child adolescent in your uh, No, we use the adolescent. No. The adolescent one, yes. Yeah. So we might uh, wait questions until each of the panel have actually spoken. So, Dave, if you would mind, yeah, I guess there's a psychiatrist. Uh, my concern is what's the holistic approach to the prevention of mental health and behavioural and emotional disturbance and uh, uh, the building up of resilience and the building up of quality of life for these children uh, so that one doesn't need so much in the way of medication. Because the, the pressure to prescribe on aggressive children is inordinate. Uh, and so a lot of my work has been around trying to build up approaches to prevention, like uh, introducing parent building, uh, capacity building programs in special schools. Uh, and I'm a big believer in getting schools to be partners in the promotion of health and mental health. And, uh, we should get uh, Jessica to talk about her study at some stage uh, because there is growing evidence about how building parental <laughs> competence is the most effective and cheapest intervention for mental health, uh, emotional behavioral disturbance, uh, and we need to build that same partnership with schools. Um, and uh, the uh, the problems that arise from failing to build that partnership with the carers in the first place uh, with early intervention uh, is what leads to you know, disastrous outcomes like a 15 year old boy who I'd seen seven years ago and I warned that without a change in parenting style this boy's adolescence would be a disaster and at 115 kilos he was abandoned into our emergency department where he needed a security guard 24 hours a day for a week before we were able to get, uh, with robust uh, interagency collaboration, him at home in a respite care placement where there would, was two to one provision of intensive uh, behavior management uh, to try and start to turn around the disaster. And the effect, you know, I think you come back to how hard it is to care for these children and uh, hopefully that this uh, uh, awareness raising exercise will draw attention to actually some of the huge risks and challenges that are faced for these families from early days uh, leading up to, in fact, adolescence is the most difficult stage. From, from 13 to 23 is the most difficult stage of managing kids with an intellectual disability or autism. That we've actually been stuck with reducing all behavior to challenging behavior and it's only more recently that we're starting to identify there are significant mental health problems attached to these kids but there's still a lack of sufficient evidence on their frequency their treatment and their management so it's a very complex issue but hopefully this today's intervention promotes the awareness that some of these issues can be tackled more holistically across our community Right. Yes, I'd, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> follow on the, the theme that David just spoke about. Uh, Shay's dad was in the audience earlier and he, he only gave me 70% for my presentation. And uh, so the reason he gave me 70% is because I didn't talk enough about the role of uh, care workers in um, this whole picture and uh, especially since I work for 
a company that um, is in that that revolution in the care space. So, uh, in terms of a multidisciplinary approach, I think uh, yes, it's very important to draw on the skills and and, and uh, specialities of everyone in the team. Uh, but I think uh, one of the biggest things that helped us with in Shay's recovery was having a case management conference. And I remember we, we had one where we brought, had about eight people around the table. We had Attic, we had psychiatrists, psychologists, we had uh, his day program. Um, yeah, everyone was there and it was really just putting down on paper what the goals were for, for recovery, for his life, for, for everything, and, and letting everybody know. So. Uh, so we were working and pulling together as a team, and uh, and and I include the Bondi Health Centre, Bondi Health Centre in 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 that as well. Uh, so yeah, and then just specifically getting back to that care worker point, um, uh, I notice uh, uh, the last four years, um, anyway, just care workers in generally, a, a lot a, a lot of them uh, do. Uh, they don't model really the best behaviour to the people they're, they're supporting. And I know sometimes um, they'll take Shay to McDonald's for an ice cream and, you know, even though it's you know, clear, I, I don't like that sort of stuff. But, yeah, I think they need to realise that what they're doing, in rewarding uh, sometimes with a hamburger or whatever it is, a sweet chocolate uh, and, and all the things we've talked about today, um, is, is really uh, contributing to people um, not having good cardio metabolic health. So I don't know if that's addressing Thank you. my response. Thank you. So, Aileen, how does an multidisciplinary approach assist you in achieving cardio metabolic risk reduction? Well, I think that um, as a GP working with people with intellectual disability, I would have enormous problems if I didn't. Uh, actually bring in the multidisciplinary team. What I mean is that um, I can't do it all alone. Um, I think gen general practitioners are very accessible to the community. Obviously you don't need a referral to go to your GP. And the GP is usually there. You, know, you can see so many GPs, there's a lot of them around. Um, and there are obviously, um, uh, we have systems in place where we can track patient's um, um, you know, life cycle, like to put it that way, uh, from birth to uh, el you know, they, they grow old. So, so really, uh, and Arani and, and Julian has uh, touched on that, is that um, GPs, if you, if you find a GP that, you, uh, that the, the, the patient uh, knows and trusts and the carers and families, uh, it is a great resource. Uh, and part of that, I guess, I see the general practitioner role. I know that um, Julian says three, but I'll give you five. Key message is that as a general practitioner, my main goal is to actually get the background and the medical history past and current. That's really important. The second thing that I do is I, I try and get as much physical examination done um, a thorough physical examination is is really essential, and it might actually take the GP several visits to do this because of um, you know related issues in regards to that. So the health assessment might not be at one visit, the annual health checkup. It might actually span through a range of of visits with little doing little bits at a time because of the nature of people with intellectual disability. So the third point is actually understanding that. And I think general practitioners do understand it because we treat a whole range of people and we understand that issue. And I'm, I'm glad that um, um, the, you know, the, the algorithm is, is, is fantastic because it actually gives us an opportunity to, as GPs, to really target each of those um, uh, issues in, in, in bite-sized 
um, capacities rather than the whole framework. And that's how I would see general practitioners using that framework in their work. Um, and knowing the understanding the patient, not only understanding the, the psychosocial issues, but also understanding their capacity. Now, what sort of function? So, we, the EPs talk about functionality. It's really important. And communication. How much? How much do the, the patients understand? How do these people understand? And how much can they? What can they do? And what can they express? And I think all these things are capable to be done within a general practice context. Obviously not in the first appointment, but in several appointments along the track. So that's the, that's the third point. The fourth point is then coming to the point of, um, after you know your patient, is actually to then pull resources to all the people that general practitioners refer to. I have a whole list, my database, computerized, and just to let the audience know, 50% of the GPs in my area, which is the central Sydney uh, GP area, uh, are computerized. So we have a form, uh, a database in our computers that we have people that we refer to, our networks. And this is really important because as general practitioners, to understand what your expertise is in that area is really important. So having EPs who are um, you know, interested in, te in treating people with mental health and intellectual disability is crucial. Knowing the dietitian who has the patience and the expertise to treat people with mental health and intellectual disability is also very important. Uh, I just don't send you know, my patients to any dietitian. Uh, I, no, I want to target that person to the right people. And I think it's the same with specialists. I think as primary care physicians, we, we know which specialists would go down this track of treatment, i.e. prescribing psychotropic medication at the first instance, or taking that extra bit of time uh, in their practice to understand the patient in their context. So that's my fourth thing. And the fifth thing is what Arani uh, referred to, is actually a reminder system. Getting the patient back, following up, GPs are good at that. We've got systems in place to actually send out um, reminders. You know, we send a hundred reminders every, you know, every month in our practice. Uh, there's a system to do this. Uh, not only for our patients with intellectual disability, but we do that with all our patients as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a proactive approach to general practice. And I'm excited because I think that the new generation of general practitioners, and maybe some of our oldies as well, uh, are getting into this space. And I, I, I don't know how many of you are general practitioners here, our primary care physicians. Yeah, and I know Kate's in the one with the practice and does the same thing. So we, in the networks, uh, primary health network, which uh, Julian um, described before, this is where we get our general practitioners interested in actually doing this sort of systems approach to primary care. And I think that intellectual disability and mental health is a you know, the area that we need to concentrate on, some of the complex needs. Thank you. So, I'd like to follow up with one question for you, which is from uh, the question submitted. Uh, do you generally include a, a nutritional or dietary kind of review as a part of your annual health check? Or, you know, how does that work? Yeah, well, I think most GPs uh, are, are interested in nutrition. We do have a lot of education around that, not to the specifics of giving dietary advice uh, in minutia, but uh, we are, the, the college has uh, guidelines on the SNAP tool, which is the smoking, nutrition, alcohol, and physical activity. So all GPs understand that, and that's part of taking a history, taking a background, and that happens as a new patient come in, we do that. 
and in annual health assessments with, um, with any of our patients, uh, let alone our intellectual disability. So yes, the, the answer is yes. And I think that as health professionals, we often forget that people with intellectual disability and mental health are entitled to the same health care as all our patients. And I think that if we can get that message out, I think that's important. It's no different. If you go to your GP, your GP should be asking you about those four things. Huh? Thank you. Uh, a question that has been submitted, but I'll just um, tease a, a couple of questions. Field to David, if that's okay. Uh, David, two, two things. Firstly, are SSRIs associated with weight gain in your experience? And what is the role of behaviour therapy in promoting um, positive, healthy lifestyle um, and avoiding uh, you know, bad habits and eating and so forth? Well, generally, SSRIs are not associated with weight gain. Um, uh, they do have other side effects, uh, and so, as, as I think Julian was talking about, the need for proper follow-up uh, is always important. Um, and I think the other sort of add-on message is that that there are a range of helpful medications, um, and all too often there's, the shorthand is you jump to the main tranquilizer, and that's all. Uh, uh, something that in, really needs a, a wider uh, expansion of uh, health and, uh, and mental health education. Um, behavior therapy, I guess that I, I, I come back to a, a little story. Uh, my, my son uh, went to a private school where uh, he came home one day and said, do you know our school this year has the strongest, fastest, fittest, most enduring uh, exercise enduring cohort it's ever had. And uh, because they do the same health assessment of, of physical activity. And actually I think that we really need to build a partnership with schools to promote the healthy lifestyles and that needs to be uh, built into, even in special education, health and mental health and resilience measures. And that's where I think you know, the research that uh, Jessica has been doing is, is uh, a really important innovation of building evidence about how schools can promote mental health. I think that we've moved a long way from really giving up on kids with intellectual disability to try and include them in the, in the community, but we've still got a huge way to go to actually I mean, equity of access means three or four times the access to health services because of their increased needs. And yet we don't have a system that enables that. Um, behavior intervention is, I mean, that's where the parenting skills comes first because actually they need to have the behavior skills, first of all. And then there needs to be a backup uh, arrangements for them to be supported in the in, in, uh, because these kids are challenging. You need superlative skills. It doesn't rely on intuitive parents' skills. And that's where expertise is essential. And that's where, uh, actually, there are so many different tiers of expertise. And uh, so, for example, Lucinda here uh, has been in, in uh, State Wide Behavior Intervention Service, with whom we've had a uh, a multidisciplinary partnership. It's really been the only multidisciplinary partnership for emotional behavior disturbance in the state because no one agency has that multiplicity of skills. And so unless we have structures that enable that interagency collaboration, you're not going to get the necessary skills for any particular individual. Thank you. Now, <coughs> I know where we're running over time. Uh, but I'm going to allow two questions from the floor to the most assertive hand of the time. <laughs> two hands. The two questions that came up from the floor. I've got a question about the NASCAR now, and um, I work in the mainstream and health services, and I just want to know my question was actually to the um, mother, um, Arani, and it was about how mainstream mental health services can 
um, as clinicians get better at um, embodying these services. Well, I'll answer that. <laughs> um, on, behalf, on behalf of Julian, because uh, in April this year, I was also invited to speak at the launch um, of the Intellectual Disability and Mental Health Core Competency Framework and Toolkit coming. So, Susan, what that is, is, is it's also a... a a framework, a body of work that, that's to be used yeah, in the hospital setting and by clinicians, Julian, am I right? Um, and it's, it's a whole uh, guide, a guide to um, upskill the workforce and, and, you know, sort of see what they, training they might need to deal better with uh, people with intellectual disability in the, in a, in a, in the mainstream mental health setting. How am I doing? No. <laughs> uh, so that was a big, big step, and I think uh, a lot of uh, you know my first-hand experience in mainstream mental health uh, through that experience with Shay. I think a lot of my concerns uh, six six years ago. Um, I think a lot of it's been addressed in the. Framework that you'll, that one we're talking about. Um, yeah. So what, did I? Was that? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's around the chronic development. I think it's what you said earlier about carers. Is that often yeah. when people go to hospital, things like diet and physical exercise kind of fall away, and focus on mental health symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I just, I guess it's, it's, um, yeah, it's something. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think I answered that. So what we need to do is. Finish the panel and then we've got some closing comments from Michael and myself. So thank you very much. Uh, so in closing, uh, people with intellectual disability are a group at high risk of cardiometabolic diseases and have a higher risk factor burden across multiple domains, and we've kind of gone through that today, uh, yet uh, experience many barriers to effective health care, including preventative health care. I think this really troubles me as I think about um, uh, needing to do a better job. Uh, clearly specific adaptations are required in clinical practice to address uh, the issue and we've outlined a way or a framework that helps a, a little bit in that regard. Um, they're my concluding comments and I'd like to invite Michael uh, to make any that he may wish to make. Thank you. Our health is everything. Without our health, what have we got? And each person is different. Individual people and intellectual disability may, may need specific help with their health. To make a tailored plan and they need support to look after their health from family, carers and medical professionals. It sounds to me like the early intervention framework is coming at the right time. Thank you.